All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. Let me just pin my speaker. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the Empowered Woman Speaker Series, Discover Your Confident, Worthy, Powerful You. This series is for you if you're ready to believe in yourself, to know your worth, and to feel confident in yourself and what you offer the world. We're going to be gathering for 90 minutes to be inspired, empowered, and uplifted, and transform your limiting beliefs and fears into new beliefs that you're going to take to the next level in your life and business. We have some incredible speakers today, and we're going to have to move fairly quickly to get through everyone. So if you have questions or comments, and Gracie is joining us too, apparently, my cat. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the chat section, and we can answer them there. Um, and... Um, so we won't have time to answer live questions unless um, the speaker ends a couple minutes early. But most of the time, we'll just uh, um, give the questions in the chat, and then they can answer them there. Our speaker lineup, our first speaker today is Sarah Howard Nelson, and her topic is acceptance and perspective in healing after trauma. Our next speaker is Ada Lloyd, and her topic is achieving emotional freedom as you quiet the voices of inadequacy and self-doubt. The next speaker will be me. And my topic is being brave to reach your vision. And last but not least is Allison Swordloff. And her topic is rediscovering your personal identity to revitalize your personal dreams. So we are on Zoom today. And um, uh, I was going to have you share this out to, the, to your people, but we can't go live on Facebook today. So um, we will not be doing that after all. <laughs> um, but... I am on a mission of empowering women and I have a Facebook group called Confident Women Community. So if you can go to, um, Lana, if you can just share the Facebook link and not the, um, or the Facebook group link and not the um, profile link, that'd be great. Um, so the Confident Women Community on Facebook, if you're not in that community, come join us there. Uh, share about how to build confidence and empower you throughout the month in between these calls and how to be your most authentic self and shine bright so that you can live your best life. So um, Lana will be posting the Facebook group link in the comments or in the chat so you can go ahead and join the group there. Okay, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker. So I'd like to introduce Sarah Howard Nelson, who will be speaking on acceptance and perspective in healing after trauma. And Sarah's journey is a testament to the power of resilience. Having faced the hardships of being a crime victim, battling multiple severe chronic illnesses, and enduring betrayal and divorce, Sarah found a way to reclaim joy and rebuild her life. With determination, a loving support system, and a strong belief that anything is possible, she discovered her own inner strength and found a strong desire to share it with others. From literally hiding under her desk from the world to public speaking about the importance of humor in a chaotic world, Sarah's message is that it is possible to find light in the darkest of times. Oh, I'm so excited to hear your talk, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Good afternoon, ladies. I, you know, healing from trauma is an incredibly broad, huge topic that trying to cover in 20 minutes is absolutely impossible for me to, to do. So for this, um, segment, I just wanted to touch on what I considered to be really my first step in truly healing from the traumas that I um, endured. And that mostly came down to acceptance. And a lot of people have a hard time with the concept of acceptance, because they feel that acceptance means that everything that bad was happened was okay that it happened. And that's not what acceptance is. And so I, I want to take this down to as simple a level as I can. And I'm actually going to start with talking about something that happened to me as a child that actually wasn't even traumatic. It made me very angry, but it was not traumatic. But it kind of set the tone for me as I grew up on handling things that were traumatic. And so I'm going to talk about my Atari. Uh, <laughs> Um, when I was a kid, uh, my parents gave me an Atari and I loved it. I absolutely loved the thing. And I used to come home from school when I was able to play it with my friend, Kristen. 
And the thing is that growing up, when I was growing up, we only had one TV in the house and you need a TV to play the Atari. And I was the youngest of, or am the youngest of five children and two parents. So there were seven of us in a home with one TV. And so the only time I got to play it was when nobody was at home. Everybody had to either be gone or in bed or whatever, but nobody else could be around. If somebody wanted to watch the TV, I wasn't allowed to play it. And one day I came home from school and my mother was in the kitchen and I went into the living room because I wanted to play the Atari by myself after school. I wanted to wind down with it before dinner, before working on homework. And it was gone. It wasn't there. And I went into the kitchen and I asked my mother, where is my Atari? And she said to me, well, you never play it. So I gave it to your brother. My brother was no longer living at home. And I was absolutely livid because the thing was, I played it a lot, but nobody saw me playing it because I could only play it when nobody was around. And I felt fully betrayed as a child because I wasn't asked. I wasn't taken into consideration. It was something that belonged to me and it was given away. And that hurt. That really, really, really hurt. And it actually took me years to put it into proper perspective and accept the fact then my mother gave it away. Even though I didn't approve of it, even though it made me very angry, it was simply a fact. It was gone. And there wasn't anything that I could do about it. And even though that was not quote unquote traumatic, it was bad. It was a huge challenge. It did hurt, but it wasn't traumatic. Later on events happened in my life, such as the betrayal from my husband, the divorce I didn't want, my, um, battling lupus for all those years very severely those were traumatic events but remembering that i had to just accept reality at times because of the atari being gone it helped me to accept that and i didn't remember it right away when my husband first or now ex-husband first betrayed me and and stuff like that it actually came up in conversations with people of of my own divorce coach going, has there ever been anything else in your life you've had to accept that really hurt you? Well, yeah, yeah, I did, I did. And that's how one of the ways that he he helped me walk through that, you know, my husband was gone and that was just fact. Didn't matter whether or not I approved, it was simply fact. And when it came to the battle with my with with my health that was on a completely different level of acceptance that i had to come to to myself and so i had lupus very very severely i mean i i literally almost bled out bled to death a couple of times and i was in a group setting a a, a support group of, for chronic illnesses and chronic pain. And we all had this battle cry against our chronic diseases. We did. And we were all fighting them. And we were all really mad and angry at what our illnesses were. And again, it was my divorce coach who brought this up, but he was bringing it up in a different um, scenario. But it, But I realized it applied to my lupus. And he said to me, he said, Sarah, what happens when someone breaks their leg? I was like, what do you mean? And he said, when somebody breaks their leg, do they immediately get up and start walking on it? Well, no. But what would happen if you immediately got up and started walking on a broken leg without a cast or anything on it? You would make it worse. And I thought about that and I thought, okay, so what do you do when you break your leg? Well, you go to the doctor, you get it looked at, you get a cast put on it, then you go home and you put it up. 
Because if you have severely broken it, you can't walk on it for a while. It has to begin the healing process. So you have to go and you have to actually give it unconditional love to your leg. You can't get up and go to, you know, go hike a mountain. You can't, you know, you just have to stop. And I thought about that with my body. And I thought, the more I tried to battle the fact that I had lupus, the more stressed I was, the more anxiety I had, the higher my cortisol levels were. And that even though I was doing everything right, I was doing gluten-free diet, Mediterranean diet, I was exercising properly, I was in physical therapy, I was doing acupuncture, I was taking the medications, I was doing all the research, I was doing everything. And I wasn't getting better. Until I went, oh, I have to treat my body with the unconditional love I would give my leg if I broke my leg. And so I finally accepted the fact that I did have severe lupus. It didn't mean that it was okay that I had it. It didn't even remotely mean that I was giving up, not even close. But what it meant was I had to take a completely different perspective and how I looked at myself and go, am I giving myself the unconditional love that I need to heal? And I had to shift the answer from no to yes. So I started over from scratch and I went back to bed. And I re-looked at everything in a completely different light. And I did it in a light of holding myself. And lo and behold, still doing all the right things that I was doing before, I went into remission. And I stayed there for a good four to five years. I was in remission. And not too long ago, about a year and a half ago, I popped back out of remission. I didn't get as sick as I was before. But this time I went, okay, okay. So it's back, it's active. And instead of getting angry, and instead of just doing this battling it, I went, what is my body trying to tell me? And sure enough, there were things that my body was trying to tell me that I needed to know. And now I know them. And so I am back to the whole embracing my body, embracing my immune system, embracing my whole being with that unconditional love that I needed. And I've already started getting better again. So I know I'm back on to the road um, of remission. So acceptance is really nothing more than a simple understanding that what has happened has happened. When someone, what someone feels, they feel. What reality is, reality is. And it is releasing control of things that cannot be controlled so that I can focus on what I can control, which is my own reactions to things, my own responses, and not trying to control anybody else or try to control a different condition. I can just control what's right in here. And when that acceptance happens, it's really, really amazing about how things can change. And that can happen with myself. And that can happen with my relationships with other people. It can happen with challenges that I go through, such as running out of gas in the desert which has happened. <laughs> so let's try an acceptance and a perspective challenge. Because one of the best ways to, to accept things is to change our perspective of things. 
So let's do this. Stop a moment and just take a deep breath. Just And just for the sake of relaxing, let's take a second one. In and out. Now you can either close your eyes or you can keep them open, whichever one you're more comfortable. But think about a person with whom you have a conflict or a difference of opinion. Who is this person to you? What is your relationship to them? Imagine yourself face to face in a discussion or in an argument with this person. Now freeze the moment. Step outside of yourself. Step outside of your own body. Step outside of your own shoes. Step to the side of the two of you and look at you both. Study the other person's face and study your own face. What do you see? Are brows furrowed together? Is there tenseness in the mouth? Are the eyes squinted shut or wide-eyed? Now step into the other person's body. Slip your feet into their shoes. Shoes feel. Do they fit you properly? Are they too tight in the toes? Are they too loose in the heels? How does this person feel right now in this discussion? Does this person feel seen by you? Does this person feel heard by you? Does this person feel respected by you? Do they have a potential motive or bias? Do they really feel this way? Or are they splitting the ambivalence because they feel defensive? Now, step back into your own body. Step back into your own shoes. Now, how do they fit? Do they fit the same way they did before? Or are they tighter? Do you feel seen by the other person? Do you feel heard? Do you feel respected? Do you have any possible hidden motives or biases even you're not aware of? And are you splitting the ambivalence because you feel you must defend yourself? Reevaluate the topic you're arguing about. How do you feel about it now? How important is it really? Can you accept this person's perspective even if you don't agree with it? Even if you disapprove of it? Is this something you can compromise? Or is it even more important than you thought it was before? Is it time to drop it? Or is it time to set boundaries? Now, how do you feel about this person? Are you able to understand their position better? Can you accept even if you cannot fully comprehend nor agree? Because remember, their shoes do not fit you. Have your feelings for this person changed? Will your future interactions with this person change? And now one more thing. What if this is a different discussion or a different argument with someone else? And that someone else is yourself. What if 
You are trying to tell yourself something and you are not accepting it. Acceptance and perspective, they are ways of releasing control. They are ways of starting new, starting fresh, and starting with unconditional love so that real healing can begin. Thank you very much. And thank you, Aaron, for putting this on. Um, and I do have I do have a free um, pamphlet on more on acceptance and perspective and control, which I will add to the chat. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was awesome. Um, I put in the chat as someone myself who has battled chronic illness, looking at like changing that perspective on it as like, well, if you had a broken leg, would you still be trying to do all this stuff? No, you'd be healing your leg. You know, <laughs> like that was such a awesome just little you know shift of perspective there so i appreciate that yeah um okay yeah the, go ahead and pop your um free gift or link that you have in the in the comments and if anyone has any comments or questions you can post those in the chat too um so a couple of people said thank you and that was really helpful so yay awesome okay uh so we're gonna move on to our next speaker on my notes here <clears throat> Our next speaker is Ada Lloyd. And Ada's topic is achieving emotional freedom as you quiet the voices of inadequacy and self-doubt. Let me go ahead and pin Ada to the screen before I finish reading her bio here. Okay, there's Ada. <laughs> now we can see her face. Um, okay. Ada, uh, her bio, as a catalyst for personal and professional transformation, Ada Lloyd is known as the chain breaker. She helps her clients break the chains of childhood abuse, trauma, and bullying that continue to impact their lives in adulthood, often with con without conscious awareness. In her signature program, Achieving Emotional Freedom Now, her clients break the chains of past childhood pain and trauma, quiet the voices of inadequacy and feelings of not being good enough, create their unique definition of success and create a roadmap to achieve their unique definition of success. So thank you so much, Ada, take it away. <laughs> Erin, thank you so much for what you have put together. This is an amazing series. Oh, you're and welcome. I loved what Sarah had to say about perspective and particularly, again, the analogy that you related to about the broken leg. I thought that was really powerful. You know, I think most of us at one time or another hear voices in the back of our heads that tell us that we're not good enough, that we can't do something that we're setting out to do. Who do we think we are? We failed last time we tried it. You know, what makes us think we're not going to fail this time? And these voices impact us. And sometimes we may know where they come from and sometimes they don't. What we probably don't realize is that 95% of the decisions that we make are in one degree or another emotionally driven. It may be conscious, it may be subconscious, it may be a combination of both. And so what are the decisions that you are making in your life that may be being influenced by voices that are telling you that you can't do it. And then we fight them and we think willpower is enough and we, you know, we're going to succeed in spite of those voices. I want you to step back and think about something. When you were a newborn baby and the doctor had, had given you to the nurse and she was cleaning you up, getting ready to give you back to mom, were you thinking about, I'm going to be a failure in life? I'm never going to be able to succeed at anything I do. Of course you weren't. All of those thoughts originate with somebody else. We may be hearing them in our voice, but they didn't start with us. They're lies. And they start in childhood. They're added to as we grow into adulthood and it just becomes a, a compounding situation. 
sometimes they come from really major significant trauma. And other times they come from what would seem to be inconsequential garden variety bullying, if you will. And I want to give you an example of, of these two extremes and how they impact us. One was a client that I had that had grown up with every kind of abuse you can imagine, physical, sexual, emotional, mental, financial. And when she finally got herself out of that situation, when she was about 18, she got herself into another abusive situation, which is not at all uncommon. And she finally extricated herself from that situation and then got into a marriage that was not a good marriage and ultimately got out of that. And then fortunately, she met a, actually reconnected with somebody she had known years before, a wonderful man who was very supportive of her and they were married. And in the meantime, she was in therapy for five years. We ultimately connected through a mutual friend and she was hesitant to try doing something different because all the things she had tried hadn't worked. And her husband was even more hesitant because he didn't want to see her disappointed again. He didn't want to spend more money on something else that wasn't going to work. Very reasonable feelings. But as she and I talked, she realized that what I was talking about was different. And so we started, and it's a 12-week program. In week six, she came onto the Zoom call with tears running down her face. And she said, you know, I've been in therapy for five years and nothing changed. In six weeks, you have changed my life. At that point, I had tears running down my face. That's the passion that I have for making that kind of an impact on somebody's life. On another extreme, I was working with a, a client about things in her adult life. And I knew that she was, now she was a, had her own bookkeeping business. She'd been an accountant her entire adult life. She was in her early 60s. And I knew that she was a CPA, but she didn't identify as a CPA. And that didn't make any sense to me because I've been surrounded by CPAs my entire life. I know what's involved in earning that designation, but I hadn't had the right opportunity to ask her about it. And so she's talking about this other situation that she was concerned about. And in passing, without it ever hitting her radar, she said, in third grade, my teacher told me I would never be a success in life because I wasn't any good in math. And she keeps talking. And in the back of my head, it's going ding, 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 ding. And so as we finished the conversation that she was focused on, I circled back and I said, tell me more about what happened in third grade. And she said, there's really not anything else to tell. And so I said, does that have anything to do with the fact that you don't identify as a CPA? Boom. Boom light bulb went off. She said, I don't feel worthy of being a CPA. She didn't feel worthy of a designation she had earned. Now, to take this one level more, for those of you who may not be familiar with what the CPA exam itself entails, that's, if there's four parts to it. There's only about 15% of the people who sit for the exam who pass all four parts the first time. She was one of them. And she didn't feel worthy of using that designation. Well, we took care of that very quickly. She changed her marketing. She changed her website. She began identifying as a CPA. And a couple of months later, she told me, she said, you've done more for my business than all of the business coaches I've hired. And I smiled and I said, thank you, but I haven't really done anything for your business. What I've done is helped you remove a barrier that has kept you from being who you are in your business. These are the kinds of things 
someplace along the line, she, because of what that teacher had told her, had made the decision not to use the CPA designation. It was a conscious decision on her part. She maintained all of her credentials over those years, but she didn't identify. Made the choice. She couldn't tell you why. It was just what felt right to her. But it went back to what a bullying teacher had told her in third grade. So here are my questions. Is in all of those years that she was a bookkeeper rather than a CPA, how much had she lost financially? How much had she lost? I mean, a CPA can do all sorts of things that a bookkeeper can't. What had she lost in terms of opportunity? What had she lost in terms of self-esteem? When these choices become our choices with us out realizing what's driving them, what kinds of opportunities are we losing? You know, we all experience things in life that were never on our bucket list. We just don't like them. They're not any fun. We, we want to pretend they don't exist. So human nature is shove it in a closet, lock the door, put chains around the door, and pretend it doesn't exist. Well, that's about as successful as trying to put smoke in a closet and think it's going to stay there. It's going to steep out under the threshold at the bottom. It's going to steep out along the sides. And it's going to, to impact us, whether it's consciously or unconsciously or a combination of both. I like to use an analogy. And in my I, in my way, it's, it's maybe my, my version of Sarah's analogy about the broken leg. But if you had a really bad headache and it stayed for days and you tried Tylenol and Anison and anything else you could think of and it simply wouldn't go away. And you finally get in to see the doctor and he does an MRI and a CT scan and some other tests. And he comes back and tells you you have a brain tumor. Now, are you going to want him to treat the headache? Or are you going to want him to treat the brain tumor? The headache was a symptom of the brain tumor. So often we have symptoms in life that we try to treat. Symptoms like self-doubt, the imposter syndrome, guilt, shame, fear. Fear of judgment, fear of success, fear of rejection, fear of failure, um, fear of abandonment. The list is enormous. These are all symptoms. They're symptoms of an underlying disease. And that underlying disease is childhood trauma, bullying, whether it's big or whether it's small. It's only when we deal with the disease that we can effectively deal with the symptom. And the clearest way kind of, of explaining that is if a child, and, and we know that abuse, the vast majority of it, happens with a family member or a close family friend. We want to think it's strangers, but that's the outlier. It's, it's somebody a child knows. And so when something happens, and they feel scared, uncomfortable, hurt, angry, and they reach out to somebody else in their family, all too often, instead of getting the love and the encouragement and the support that they desperately need, they get judgment. It's your fault. It didn't really happen. It's not that big of a deal. Get over it. And a child has no place to go, but they're still in pain. So what do they do? They look for anesthesia. If dad has a booze cabinet, if mom has pills in the medicine cabinet, if all else fails, there's always a refrigerator. And they look for something that will be anesthesia to pain. Well, it works, or at least to a point. So the next time they're in pain, they try the same anesthesia, and then it becomes you know, a way of dealing with stress, and then it becomes a, a habit. 
So what happens? You now have this adult that, for example, may be addicted to alcohol. So they go into a great addiction recovery program and they come out and they're absolutely positive that they've conquered this. Well, unfortunately, the failure rate is astronomically high. And in most cases within the year, they will either be back with the same addiction or they will have traded it for a different addiction, like gambling. So if they traded for a different addiction, then the addiction recovery program for alcohol is a success because they're no longer dealing with an alcohol addiction, but they're still dealing with addiction. And the only way that these programs can really be a success long-term and have the impact they're designed to have long-term is when we cure the underlying disease. And that underlying disease is something they experienced in childhood. And so, you know, we all have experienced, you know, things that, that were unfair that, you know, impacted us. You know, Sarah, when her precious Atari was given to her brother, you know, sometimes they're, they're big things, sometimes they're little things, but we carry these things with us into adulthood. And so how do we get rid of it? Well, the way that I work with people is that we help an individual identify what's their story versus what their abuser and enabler's stories are. Your story is what you experienced, how you felt about it then, how you feel about it now, and how you feel about what you heard. Not what you heard, but how you feel about it. The most common line we hear in domestic violence is, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have had to do that. That's the underlying premise, verbally or non-verbally, behind every bit of abuse. An abuser is always going to look to blame their victim for their choice. You are never, ever responsible for somebody else's choice. So we separate out your story from their story. And you really know more about their stories than you think you do. It's sort of like a puzzle. If you're putting together a puzzle and there's a few pieces missing, you get everything together and there's still a few pieces missing, but you've got the essence of what that puzzle is going to look like. You know enough to know what the, the puzzle really looks like. And it's the same thing as you're looking at the stories of abusers and enablers. You know enough, and then we can separate out your story from theirs. Now, the legacy of all of that are the voices that you're hearing. And you may be, if your father was your abuser, you're hearing his voice. But if you've heard it long enough, you've internalized it maybe, and you're now hearing it in your voice. So then we have to go back another step and determine where it was that you heard it before you internalized it. Because remember that baby? That baby wasn't born with that message, whatever it was. And so once we can look at that voice, having separated out your story from their stories, we know it's a lie. They lied about you. They lied about who you are. They lied about what you are capable of doing. How do you confront a lie? You confront it with truth. So for example, in the story I told you about the woman who didn't self-identify as a CPA, when we went through this process, we did the first five steps together. And then I said, okay, you finish it up on your own. And the first five steps looked like this. How did you do in math in high school? Well, I got all A's. Okay. How did you do in math in college? Um, well, I got all A's. Okay. I, you passed the CPA exam. Yeah. You're one of the 15% that passed it the four times. First, uh, uh, the, all, all four parts of the first time. Have you ever bounced a check? Uh, no. These are all facts that disprove the lie that she wasn't any good in math. 
and then went on and added more. And so when she hears that voice that says, you're not any good because you're no good in math, you're not going to be a success. And I don't remember her teacher's name, but let's say it was Mrs. Jones. Verb in her mind, she's saying, Mrs. Jones, you're wrong because boom, 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 encounters with five facts. Gradually, that quiets Mrs. Jones' voice. Now, I'm making a complicated system, you know, pretty simple because of time. But that's the essence, is that those voices don't come from you. They come from somebody else who is looking to have power at your expense and diminish you in the process. And they sought to make you responsible for their choice to diminish you. And so this is about making them responsible for their choice so that you have the freedom to then be who you are, to create your unique definition of success, to know, to be able to use it as a mindful filter, to know when to say yes and when to say no, because we're way too inclined to say yes when we know that we should say no, and how to do that so that it really strengthens the relationship rather than, you know, we're always afraid that if we say no, it's going to hurt the relationship. It's not saying no, it's in how you say no and doing it in a way that validates somebody else, but still keeps their monkey on their shoulder and leaves you space for you. Because how often have you said, I will do this, something important to you, as soon as I do this, and that's something for somebody else because you're an honorable person who's going to keep your commitment to somebody else. But what about not being an honorable person who keeps your commitment to yourself? Every day, I would encourage you to create one to three action steps, plans, not a to-do list, a specific action that is going to take you towards your goal for the week that will take you towards your goal for the month, that will take you towards a long-term goal that is in alignment with your unique definition of success. And then that night, have a personal accountability session that says, did I blow it off? Did I do enough to check a box? Or did I really do what I committed to do? Thanks, Erin. Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Ada. <laughs> That was great. Um, so everyone, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the chat. And then Ada, um, I know you had a gift for everyone. Um, so put that in the chat. And why don't you tell everyone what it is as well and then put the link or um, your email so they can contact you in the chat. Would you like to tell us what your gift is, Ada? You're mute. I have to unmute myself again. <laughs> I created a new book that's Shattering Hidden Barriers. And the barriers are things that are those some of those things that come from childhood that are very common. And then seven strategies to overcome them. And because I'm technologically challenged, uh, all of the pieces for the link aren't working. So I'm going to just tell you to email me and I will email it to you. Awesome. No worries. <laughs> cool. So yeah, pop your email in the chat and everyone, if you'd like to get her gift um, and, and tell us what it is in the chat to Ada so they know okay. they remember um, what it is. And then everyone can email Ada so that you can get um, her gift. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Ellen. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to pin myself because I'm going to speak next. And let me grab my notes. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone too, if you weren't here earlier, if you're not in the Confident Woman Community Facebook group, there is a link that I can have Lana pop into the chat. So um, go ahead and come and join us in the Facebook community. We do things there in, in between these um, uh, live events. So come on, come on and join us in the Facebook group. I'd love to have you. And so now I am going to speak on how to be brave to reach your vision. 
Uh, last month in my talk, Unleash Your Power to Become Unstoppable, I shared my acronym that I created uh, for BOLD, which stands for, I'm going to repeat it a couple times so you can write it down, but the acronym for BOLD is Be Brave. O is get out of your comfort zone. L is let go of limiting beliefs and fears. And D is do the unexpected. So today my talk is be brave to reach your vision. And so I'm gonna go deeper into the first part, be brave. And again, the bold stands for be brave, get out of your comfort zone, <clears throat> let go of limiting beliefs and fears and do the unexpected. And I'm gonna go ahead and pop that in the chat too so you can Write that down if you like. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so first I wanna tell you my story and I know some of you here have already heard my story, um, but I am a confidence transformation coach for women. So I help women to see their worth, see their value, step into their who they are, authentic, their authentic self, um, to reach their vision and truly see that they have value to bring and they're worthy of everything that they desire. Um, but I actually used to be very shy. Some people used to describe me as painfully shy, believe it or not. But I always had, even as a kid, I had this big vision. I have always wanted to make a difference for others and in the world. Um, <clears throat> and so I have always throughout my life done things to help me build my vision or help me build my confidence to reach that vision, to help more people. And so, you know, I've, I've done all sorts of different things throughout my life uh, to do that. Uh, but one of the things that I did, and I'll share a little bit more about this in a minute, was I joined passion parties back in 2008. And so I, for five years, I sold lotions, potions, things that go buzz in the night and to groups of women. And I did that on purpose in order to build my confidence so that I could keep moving forward with helping people in their lives. Um, and, and, you know, working towards my mission and, and making a difference in the world. So being brave though, starts with a super clear vision. So first we're going to talk about vision a little bit. I teach vision board workshops, visioning workshops, and my workshops are so much more than just making vision boards. A lot of vision board workshops are like a couple hours long and they make vision boards and that's all great. Mine are two days long because we first start with what's the vision? What, what is this big vision that you have for your life? And then what are the things in your way? Because the things that are going to get in your way are going to stop you from creating your vision. So the things that might be in your way, your limiting beliefs, your fears, your feelings that you aren't worthy, um, all these different things that are in our minds stop us from, um, moving forward, stop us from reaching that vision. And so we do a whole day on what's in your way and clearing out those blocks in order to get to your vision. But if I give my, um, the ladies a few questions to get started with your vision and I'll give them to you now. I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you want? And ask it over and over and over again. I have them do this in the workshop for several minutes um, with the partner what do you want? Asking each other, what do you want? Why do you want it? So what do you want and why do you want it? And they keep asking each other over and over again. And it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And then how do you want to feel when you have that thing? That one's super, super important because that feeling, like when you visualize what you want, like, oh, I want, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's you want to find the love of your life and you're like, Oh, I want to feel so calm and peaceful and happy and joyful with this person. I want to feel safe. And so you start getting into that feeling of what you want. Right? So those three questions are super, super important to get you to your vision. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to be brave around that too. But I want to ask you to share in the comments, what is your vision or what, what do you want? Why do you want it? How do you want to feel? Share something in the comments um, around those questions. I'd love to hear from you about that. So reaching your vision, it takes being brave, right? You have to get outside your comfort zone. You have to do the unexpected. You have to um, let go of limiting beliefs and fears. So I want to share some stories with you from my own journey of bravery. And then I'll share some tips on how, that you, how you can do that too. 
So I mentioned I joined Passion Parties. I did that for five years. I built a team. Um, and that was that was a real fake it till you make it five years because I was so terrified of speaking in front of people and um, and then to have to be selling, you know, sex toys um, was a huge other layer. Right. But I kept moving forward and um, through that fear. So my very first party I ever booked was actually at Macy's at the makeup counter. I thought, what if I go to the makeup counter and just start talking to the ladies who do the makeup there and see, you know, if anyone wants to book a party and I booked one and I was so scared to just walk up to random women and start talking to them about booking a party. But someone was really interested and she booked a party. And I think she had several parties for me over the years. We're still friends on Facebook. Um, so that was a really scary thing to do outside my comfort zone. Another thing that I did while doing passion parties was um, I did some bar parties. So different bars that had separate rooms available. I would send them a letter and then I would go in and talk to the person in charge. And some people actually booked me to do bar parties. And that was a whole nother beast because these are totally random people. They're probably drunk, you know? And so that was like taming wild animals, you know, but it took a ton of bravery and getting past my fears, um, to do those things. Um, and then coaching through passion parties, I met my first coach. I knew about coaching and I, I loved the idea of it. And through coaching, I met, or through passion parties, I met my first coach and I learned about limiting beliefs and, and how to, that you could actually change your brain. You can actually change the way you think. And so I became a coach. I have a psychology degree as well. And I knew that I was going to have to learn to speak. I knew that I was going to have to do events in order to bring people in and to make my difference. And, you know, my very first speech was me. I literally typed it out word for word. And I, I read it like this so close to my face. I was so terrified. And there was only a few people there and they all knew me very well, but I was still panicked. Right. And now I've done a lot of events myself. I, I ran my first retreat in 2019 and that was a huge vision and dream that I'd had for years, which took a lot of bravery to happen. So I um, don't take a sip of water. <laughs> um, I think I had tried to plan my first one in 2018 and it didn't work out. I realized pretty quickly that my business wasn't quite where I wanted it to be or needed it to be in order to um, fill and run a retreat. So I canceled and then I rescheduled for, I think, August of 2019. And I realized that was a terrible time to do it because everyone had kids going to school, back to school and summer ending and all the things. So I rescheduled it again. And, you know, I, I rescheduled it for October and I ended up filling it. Um, and it, literally at the last minute, like a week before I had the last couple of people, um, sign up to come, but I had a lot of fear around doing my first retreat. I was very, very excited. It was my dream and it was my vision for years, but I had a lot of fears. I feared looking like a failure. I feared looking like a loser. If I kept rescheduling or if it didn't work out, I feared looking like I didn't know what I was doing or actually not knowing what I was doing. Um, but I kept trusting and I kept promoting and talking to people and it filled and it was incredibly transformational. Five years later, I'm still, it lights me up when I think about this retreat because the, the ladies were literally different two days later when they left. We have pictures of everyone's faces close up from at the very beginning, the very end, and they were different humans. It was absolutely amazing. So I was brave. I fought past that fear and those limiting beliefs. And I kept moving forward because I had my big vision. I kept focusing on the vision. I kept thinking about the house that we rented and what is it going to be like when I, when we're in the house and what is, you know, what are we going to talk about? And what is it going to be like when the ladies are getting those aha moments and having those transformations right in front of my eyes? And, and it worked. <clears throat> um, so I will come back to, um, the comments. I see there's lots of comments over here. I'm very excited to look at them. Um, I'm going to keep reading or keep going through the talk and then I will go to the comments. Um, so one, run, one area it takes being brave is that is looking at 
and becoming aware of your limiting beliefs and fears and challenging them every day and your behaviors too. So <clears throat> our limiting beliefs, our fears, they turn into our behaviors and they hold us back, right? They block us from getting to where we want to be. And we all have them. Every single person on the planet has them. Um, no matter how long that you've worked on it, that things are still going to come up. The next level you try to go to, you're going to have more limiting beliefs and fears going to that next level. Um, and so we just have to keep, keep being aware, keep, keep, um, working on those things, keep noticing when you're in fear. So I want you to start thinking about things like, are you sabotaging, sabotaging your efforts? Maybe you're not following up. If you have a business, maybe you're, you know, doing something like this, maybe you're running an event or you're um, talking to people, but you're not following up with people after networking or whatnot. Maybe you aren't taking the steps necessary to reach your goals. And you might wonder why you're not reaching your goals, but then you realize, well, I guess I'm not really taking the steps. I'm in a lot of fear. So I'm not moving forward with those, with the goal. Maybe you fear you aren't enough or you're not worthy of that dream. That's a big one is people will think, oh, I really have this dream of maybe it's, you know, new floors in your house or a new car. Or maybe it's a dream of helping people like running a retreat for me um, was, and maybe that next thought is, but I can't have that. That's not for me. That's a worthiness piece that you have to think about. Am I feeling worthy of attaining that thing that I'm, that I'm wanting to create? <clears throat> or are you hustling for worthiness? This is a Brene Brown term which is like you're working really, 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 really hard and you're pushing and you're hustling. And um, you think that once you reach that goal that you're hustling towards, that then you'll finally be worthy. But that's not how it is at all. You're always worthy, no matter what. You're inherently worthy 100% of the time, whether you spend a day in bed or whether you totally kill it one day and get your whole to-do list done. You are worthy no matter what, all the time. You might find yourself comparing yourself to others with social media. That is so easy to do. And it's so, it can be so toxic to ourselves because we see all these people posting great, wonderful things and they're so happy and da, 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 but we don't see behind the curtain, right? We don't know what's really going on in their lives. And oftentimes there is more going on that we don't see. So comparing ourselves to others is just hurting us um, from moving forward. It's, it's hurting our confidence and, um, <clears throat> it's really not a healthy thing to do. So just focus on yourself. Um, you might be stuck in perfectionism. I certainly am a recovering perfectionist. It's something I've struggled with my whole life, but perfectionism is really a shield that we use to keep ourselves safe from criticism, from being judged, um, from being seen, we have these fears of, you know, being judged and criticized. And so we get into perfection and we think that if we're perfect, which nobody is, it's not, it's not a thing for human beings, um, that it'll keep us safe from being judged. Um, shrinking your dreams. We might be, you might find yourself doing that to fit what you think you're worthy of to fit your worth. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different things that we do that, holds us back. Um, another thing I did last year is a year ago. Um, now I did a contest. It was called fab over 40. And I talked about this before last month, but, um, I won't go into all the details, but basically what I did was one of the things I did was I reached out to, I was introduced to Tina Makua from good day Sacramento. And she's been on air for I don't know, 30 years between radio and TV. I was terrified. My friend knew her and introduced us. And I was like, oh my God, this is so scary. And I doubt she's ever even going to respond. Um, cause I, I was raising money for, um, breast cancer and through this contest. And so she actually responded within like 20 minutes and wanted to have me on, on the show. And I was so scared. It was very, very exciting, but it was terrifying because I knew that this show was like one of the top watch shows in Sacramento and there would be thousands of people watching, but I pitched my story. I reached out. I was totally scared. I was totally afraid of going blank on air or not saying the wrong or the right thing or rambling too much or looking dumb. 
but I did it and it was amazing. And I just, what I did was, is I kept practicing what I would say. And I knew I had about three minutes. So I just kept practicing, practicing. And I visualized the segment. I visualized what I was going to say. I visualized having fun and I was confident and it went amazing. So I'm telling you these stories to tell you that someone who's very, who identifies as having been very, very shy can also build confidence and do things that are very scary and um, take a lot of bravery and confidence. So I want you to think about <clears throat> what is your fear? <clears throat> what fears do you have that are holding you back from moving forward? What beliefs are you carrying around that are slowing you down or stopping you from moving forward? So if you're feeling brave, I'd love to hear a belief or um, a fear <clears throat> in the comments. A belief or fear, I'd love to hear you, hear you share what beliefs or fears that you have that are holding you back. So a few tips on being brave. Start paying attention to the thoughts you have every day, especially as it pertains to your dreams. So it could be, like I was saying earlier, it could be, oh, I really want to have this retreat or, oh, I really want to, you know, <clears throat> X, Y, Z. Oh, but I'm not there yet. I, I'm not good enough for that yet. I'm not worthy for, of that. I don't, I don't really deserve that. Notice the thoughts. And once you're aware of the thoughts, you can begin to change them. Okay. And these thoughts might be really ingrained. We've, we've lived long lives. We're all decades old, right? So be patient with yourself. Have compassion with yourself. Notice the thought and then say, okay, this is a thought I have. I've had it for a while. I, can, I know that. So this is something I've developed and held on to for a lifetime. It's going to take time to change. I'm going to be pause, um, uh, compassionate with myself. And I'm going to start changing the thought to something more positive. I can have that. Yeah, I am worthy of that. I do deserve that. Right? I'm inherently worthy of having that thing. So focus on your vision. Do that exercise that I talked about at the beginning. What do I want? Why do I want it? And how do I want to feel? Focus on that. Focus on that vision. Create it and get deeper with that. And then visualize reaching that vision. Visualize having that life that you dream of and you're going to start to see changes okay <clears throat> so finally i just want to remind everyone here that you are brave even if you think you're not brave you are brave and you're inherently worthy of everything that you desire and you can act you can reach your vision for your life you can absolutely have everything that you desire i believe in you so for everyone here, my gift to you today is a free Confident Woman Visioning call. And this is a call where I will support you in getting to your next level of your vision and your confidence. So you might be here and you might think you, you're, if you feel super confident where you are now, and that's awesome. But whether, no matter how you feel about your confidence, whether you're feeling super confident or whether you're struggling with your confidence, I can help you with this call to expand your vision and expand your confidence to get you to the next level, okay? So I would love to talk to all of you. It's absolutely um, complimentary. So I would love to talk to you. Just type call into the comments or send me a message if you would like to book a call with me and I'll reach out and get that, um, we'll get you scheduled. So type call into the comments. Now I'm gonna, I know I have just one minute left. I'm just gonna read through a little bit. <clears throat> oh, there's so many comments. Um, Sarah says, I want to move over to do more speaking engagements. Yeah. Um, Lisa, I want to help more women remove obstacles to reach their goals and dreams and feel comfortable with making money. Yeah, absolutely. Mon, I want to walk outside more and feel more relaxed and less anxious. Oh, yeah. Allison, I want to speak more, help more women change their lives. Marlena, I want more opportunities speaking. Yeah, magic and making a difference. Yes. Step into and realize their greatness. Yay. Lisa, planning my first retreat for next year. Yay! I'm going to plan my next retreat for next year, too. Yay! <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, I want, Sarah, I want to write a book. 50 years of friendship. I have, oh, you have, 
That's awesome. Your best friend, 50 years. Um, Allison, want to write a book about the journey of self-discovery and important of self-care. Yeah. Okay, now my time's up. Let me just finish with these comments really quick. Love the flow. Yeah, this is awesome. Thank you, Ada. Um, Jocelyn, fear of making a big mistake and being humiliated. Yeah. Rin, uh, make myself smaller so I don't intimidate others. Yeah, we've gotten that message a lot, right? We're too big, we're too much. Um, Ada, fear that I can't be as effective on virtual as live and live is, I lost it. Uh, probably not in my future. Um, you can do it, Ada. Sarah, I make myself smaller too. Lana, I believe that has held me back is thinking something is a much bigger issue than it really is. Every time it comes to me, time to handling the issue, it's never as bad as I believed. Yeah, <laughs> I do that too. Oh, it's gonna be hard, blah, blah. <laughs> so hard and then we, and then it's not when you actually do it. Put it off for a long time. Um, okay, Paige and Marlena, awesome. I will get to you with my schedule. Um, and Jan, help women embrace their strengths and align their priorities so they can grow in all areas of their life. Awesome. You ladies are so awesome. Thank you for, for playing along and for um, commenting and keeping the chat going. I appreciate it. I will um, respond to you as well. Okay, so next we have our last speaker, Allison. <clears throat> Okay, let me let me grab Allison real quick. And there she is. There's Allison. <laughs> so let's see. Allison will be speaking to us about rediscovering your personal identity and revitalizing your personal dreams. Allison Swordloff is the own, owner of the Oxygen Mask Effect LLC, a consulting and coaching company providing business, life, and wellness coaching for women over 40 helping them learn to put their health, wealth, well-being, and happiness first. Allison believes in a holistic, whole-person approach to working with their clients and, who are experiencing midlife transition and burnout. Her clients have given their all to everyone else and put their own health and well-being aside. I'm sure none of you know anything about, thing about that, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, she believes- not. None of us experience that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she believes that in order for them to become the person they're meant to be, they need to rediscover their personal identity and revitalize their personal dreams, including putting their health and well-being in the forefront of their lives. Yes, Absolutely. Allison holds multiple certifications, including certified virtual coach, certified can feel success trainer, women specialist coach, and a certified nutrition coach. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for being here, Allison. And I am excited. Thank you so much, Erin, yeah, for having away. me. Yeah. I do want to say, hopefully you won't hear too much noise, but they've been working on our complex for a little while and they're painting. So we might hear the ladders. I apologize for that. Unfortunately, it's literally right outside my window, so I can't control it too much. No <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to put that out there. Um, I am excited to be here. And this topic is extremely important. It's personal, very personal to me. And I know it's important to everybody else. And it's rediscovering your identity and reawakening your dreams. We all know that midlife, hold on one second, my view was shifted for some reason, that midlife is a powerful time. And it's often it's associated with transition and burnout, but it can also be a profound time of self-discovery and renewal. And if you've ever felt like life has pulled away from you or pulled you away from your true self, or you've wondered what happened to the dreams you once had, this talk is definitely for you. And I want you to know you're not alone in this experience. So just beware. Um, many women at this stage of life feel stretched thin by responsibilities. We have work, family, relationships, and somewhere along the line, our passions and dreams have gotten lost in the dreams of everybody else. But here's the beautiful thing the dreams and the sense of self are still there. They're just waiting to be rediscovered. So let's take a little time today. And I'm going to ask you while I'm going through these theories and these things to think about, really put yourself in there and think about them. You don't, you can write your responses in the chat or just reflect 
on who you really are and how you can start living a life that feels more authentic and fulfilling. Now, I'm going to start with burnout and identity loss. And the reason I'm starting with that is we all know what burnout is. You're doing everything for everybody else, but it's not just about feeling tired, although that's part of it. Burnout is also feeling disconnected from yourself, from your passions, and sometimes even from the people around you. Maybe you've been caught up in juggling work, family, and all the shoulds, and I'm purposely using quotes on that. Um, all the shoulds that come with being a woman at this stage of life. You've raised your children, you had your career, whatever it is, but you're doing what you should be doing, not what you want to be doing. So you might feel like you've been so busy being everything to everyone else that you've forgotten who you really are. And to me, that's important. How many of you have ever found yourself asking, who am I? outside of my roles as a mom, partner, professional, caregiver? I'm, I know I did at one stage. I mean, it's such a common question at this stage of life. You've spent so many years pouring into everybody else and you've lost sight of who you are. You've lost sight of your needs, your dreams and desires. When that happens, life can start to feel like it's one big to-do list rather than something you're actively enjoying. This was me back in 2011. And that's how I started here. It was then, it was a couple of months after losing my mother in December of 2010. I realized I didn't know who Allison was because I was so busy doing for everybody else that I was lost as an individual. I was a wife, a mother, take care of the house, working. I did, I was so involved in my children's lives, not that that's a problem, but I was so involved in my children's lives that my identity was their mother or their scout leader or the PTA class parent. It wasn't Allison as a person. It was all me as everybody else. So I was lost. I didn't remember who Allison was and I was no longer happy. I started on my journey of self-discovery and I'll go into a little bit more details on it in a little bit because there's another section that actually, it that part of the journey relates to a little bit more. But I realized after a while, probably about a year and a half to two years that I was actually in an emotionally and verbally abusive marriage. And we had been married for over 20 years. Uh, I think it was like 22 or 23 years at this point. And through my journey, I developed the strength to leave for my own peace of mind and my mental health. But here's the thing. Being burnt out doesn't have to be the end of the story. Burnout is actually a signal that it's time to slow down and reassess. It's time to get curious about yourself again. I see that exactly right, Sarah. You're everybody else, you're everybody's mother. Um, it's time to get curious about yourself again, to remember who you are beneath all the layers. And that's what I'm going to explore with you today. And we're going to next talk about rediscovering your core identity. And this is where I want you to think about your responses. We're going to talk about who you are at the core. I want you to reflect on a few questions. You don't need to have the answers right away. Let them sit with you and come up with your answers that way. What are your, the first question, what are your core values? What really matters to you deep down? What brought you joy and fulfillment when you were younger, before the demands of work and family took over? What passions or hobbies or interests have you set aside for doing the shoulds? When was the last time you thought about what makes you happy and what makes you, you outside of what you do for others? It's still, I'm still figuring that out so many years later, but it's probably been a long time since you've thought of those things and that's okay. 
the important thing is that the woman you who once felt passionate, alive, and connected to her dreams is actually still within you. She hasn't gone anywhere. She's just been quiet, waiting for the right moment to come back to the surface. Rediscovering your identity is about peeling back the layers of expectations. Those placed on you by society, family, yourself. It's about reconnecting with your authentic self. The person who you were before you started conforming to all the rules life gave you. All the roles that life gave you and the rules that go along with those roles. The sta this stage of life can be a beautiful opportunity to do that. It's not about reclaiming the past by any means. It's about rediscovering who you are today and what really lights you up. Because you're not the same person you were 20, 30 years ago when you first started your adult life. Maybe for you, it means going back to an old passion. Something you used to love, but let go when life got busy. Or maybe it's about exploring completely something completely new. Something you've always wanted to do, but never gave yourself permission to do it. Whatever it is, it's about reconnecting with you. For me, at the time, I spent time joining crafting groups, book groups, community groups, and social groups. I found a group, a social group that got to know me as me. They didn't know my family. They just got to know Allison as Allison, not Allison as a wife, mother, community leader, et cetera. Just me. This group became my new social circle who started inviting me to go out to dinner, get drinks, and more. And from that group, I actually met the amazing person who later, I wasn't expecting this, but three years after we met, he became my life partner. We've been now been together just about 10 years and even moved cross country together during the pandemic. Because we discovered when New York shut down, we could actually live together without killing each other. We had a 14 week cohabitation experiment and discovered we could actually do it because we were living in separate areas of New York. So it all was because of this social group that I met him. And he has been the biggest supporter of my changes in life. Now that we've talked about rediscovering you and your passions, let's re talk about revitalizing your dreams. I'm not talking just about the dreams you had when you were younger, although those are important places to start. I'm also talking about the dreams you have now the dreams that maybe you've buried because you thought they weren't realistic or because life got in the way. I know we all have things that we've always said, I want to do this when I'm older. I want to take care of that. I want to do this. And what have we done? Piled them up, piled them underneath everything else. So the question I'm going to ask you today is what if it's not too late? What if midlife is actually the perfect time to pursue those dreams? Here's the thing, you've gained so much wisdom and experience over the years. You know yourself better now than you did in your 20s or 30s. And because of that, you're in a unique position to create a life that's aligned with who you truly are today, not aligned with who you were 20 years ago. Midlife isn't a time for settling down or winding down. It's a time for revitalizing, reimagining, and reigniting your dreams. So I'm going to ask you this question, and you can definitely put it in the chat because I'm curious to see. This is a, these are the next couple of questions you can probably answer very quickly. What are your dreams today? What would make you feel alive again? What's something you've always wanted to do, but haven't given yourself permission to pursue? Maybe it's writing a book, starting a new business, learning to paint, or traveling to a place you've always wanted to visit. Or maybe it's something simpler, carving out more time for yourself each week to do something you love. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. And I'm going to encourage you to start small. You don't have to overhaul your entire life overnight because Sometimes revitalizing your dreams is just as simple as making space for them, even if it's just 10 minutes a day or an hour a week. 
It's about taking small intentional steps toward living a life that excites you. One of my dreams was always to travel. I was never able to do it. And the reason, there are a couple of reasons, you know, finances is part of it. Um, but also my husband was not a good traveler. The one international trip we took was to Israel back in 1994. And he, the 12-hour flight was horrible. He did not do well in cramped quarters. And not a good traveler. If it wasn't convenient, if it wasn't within a couple of hours flying, he had trouble with it. And or we drove down the we did a lot of East Coast drives because we were in New York. But I never had the opportunity to really travel. My partner. My boyfriend, due to his career and his hobby, he travels the world, both for work and for diving. And through my relationship with him, he's giving me gifts of experiences. And those gifts are actually world travel. I've been to Las Vegas, London, Barcelona, San Fran um, Singapore, New Zealand, Places I never imagined I'd ever get to go. But he, thank goodness, is able to afford it. I'm not saying everybody can do these international trips. There are a couple that I've done that actually are relatively convenient, like going to the Galapagos, I recommend that. Uh, <laughs> um, we actually did a Galapagos cruise last year. And that's not that difficult to get to. Ecuador, people think Ecuador is so hard. It's not. But I've been able to experience the world in a way I never thought I could before because I couldn't with my husband. And for me, that was always my dream. And to me, it was a dream that was never happening. In the last seven years, I can't even count the travels we've done. So think think about those items, think about those dreams and, fig and then you can figure start figuring out how you can accomplish them. And if it's not world travel, that doesn't matter. That can still be a dream and you can make other aspects happen. But before I end, because I know I'm getting near the end, I'm actually looking forward to reading some of these comments. I do want to leave you with this thought. Midlife isn't the end of your story. In many ways, it's just the beginning of a new and more authentic chapter. Today, you have the power to rediscover who you are and reignite the dreams that have been awaiting for you. And I want you to reflect on one small thing that you can do in the next week to reconnect with yourself. Just one thing, and that I'd like to see in the comments as well. What is one thing you're going to do to, for yourself in the next week to reconnect with who you are? Maybe it's setting aside time for an old hobby. Maybe it's simply journaling about the dreams you've put on hold. Whatever it is, cre commit to taking the first step. I want to thank you for listening. I'm very happy to have been here. Thank you for showing up for yourself and for being willing to explore what it means to live a life that truly reflects who you are. The best is yet to come. And I can't wait to see how you rediscover yourself and your dreams. And in order to help you in this process, I'm actually going to include a link to download a copy of my Journey of Self-Discovery Journal. And I hope you take the time to sit and truly think about who you are looking to become in this stage of your life. And one thing I do want to say with the journal, it's not a one-time thing. There are sections in the journal for weekly thoughts and even an area that you can come up with daily thoughts. So feel free to reprint those pages that you want to do on a weekly basis. So I'm going to add the link in the chat. And Erin, thank you again for having me here. Yay, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. If anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I know you guys have been commenting away over here. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for the interaction. I, <laughs> I am actually enjoying these comments because we've got a couple of people wanting to write their books. Mm -hmm. um, Jocelyn, have your business generating 75,000 in residuals. That can definitely happen. Writing a book, taking a leap and starting your own law practice page. That is amazing. 
journal about writing the book, ideas. Yeah, Sarah, it's one of those things you don't think about. I was 44 when I started my journey back in 2011. So, and the first step set up one-on-ones. No, this is great. And I'm going to connect, add the link. And again, I hope that everybody got something out of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get wrapped up. We'll just be a couple more minutes and we're just coming up to the 2.30 time. Um, again, everyone, oh, let me mean myself here. <clears throat> again, everyone, if you aren't in the Facebook group yet, um, please come and join us there, the Confident Woman community. Lana, if you could drop that link again in the chat so everyone could come join the community, that'd be great. And again, just a quick reminder for everyone here, I am offering a free Confident Woman Visioning Call. Again, this is to get you to your next level of your vision and your confidence, no matter where you're at now, whether you feel super confident or where you're, maybe whether you're not feeling as confident, I will help you to get to that next level with your vision and your confidence and help you see what might be in the way and how we can get you to that next level. So type call into the comments and I will make sure to um, book that with you. And then um, if you enjoy the call today, hopefully you did. We had some awesome speakers. We're going to be doing it again next month. Um, next month is November 7th, same time, 1 to 2.30 Pacific. So if you want to make sure to get on next month's call, type November in the comments. And if you're already registered for this month or last month, you're going to get the information there too. So you're already on the list. Um, so you don't have to re-register just so you know. But it is November 7th. So if you want to make sure you're on the list, type November in the comments and I'll make sure you're on the list. And then real quick, our speakers for next month are Whitney Wiley, and she'll be talking about fearless confidence, turning self-doubt into strength. Crystal Riley, talking about conquering your fears and let your inner sparkle shine. Philippa Bagley, and she'll be talking about the power of subconscious healing, transforming anxiety and stress into empowerment. And then I will be speaking about the O in my bold acronym, which is getting out of your comfort zone for more confidence. So until then, I will see you in the Facebook group. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Hopefully you got a lot out of it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in November. Woo -woo! <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, speakers, please make sure to stay on for a few minutes. And everyone else, if you could drop off, that would be awesome. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Stop.